Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like you please to turn in Galatians once more to chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 1 through 11, and it begins in this way. It says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then, when you knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. We saw last time as we concluded in chapter three that it mentioned the idea of them being both sons and heirs through Christ. And so if you notice in verse 26 of chapter 3, for as many as of you who have been baptized into Christ, so that's verse 27, verse 26, for you are all child, the children of God, or literally the sons of God, by faith in Christ Jesus. So that's verse 26. And then verse 29, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs, according to the promise. So he mentions the idea of being sons and of being heirs. And he's going to take up that idea of our sonship and our heirship uh, as a result of the work of Christ. So that's kind of the theme of chapter four. So just to give an outline, and uh, we're going to notice verses one through seven, the adoption, uh, just the simple theme of adoption, uh, eight through 11, anxiety. Paul's afraid for them because they're leaving their privileged position and being tempted to go back into bondage. And so he has a natural anxiety about them. In verse 12 through 20, he's going to make a stirring appeal to them uh, not to make this turn and uh, not to go back. And then he's going to end this chapter with an allegory in verse 21 down to verse 31. And he's going to take up Abraham again. It's amazing how many times he's mentioned Abraham. And so Abraham's going to come back into the picture again as an illustration. And so basically, uh, that's the outline of the passage. And uh, again, it's it's amazing to, to think, when we think of this topic of sonship, uh, that we're sons of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that in order to accomplish our sonship, and we mentioned this last time, the Lord Jesus voluntarily became a servant so that we might be raised to the dignity of sons. We were in slavery. We were bond servants in a sense. We were slaves to all kinds of things, and yet he who was the son, and, and it, of course he never ceased to be that, but but he became a servant in order to elevate us to the position of sonship. And so he in, begins with our preparation for sonship in verses one through three. And he begins this way, he says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. So he's using an illustration well known to his readers. And the idea is this, that a child or a minor may be an heir to a large and prosperous estate. But while he is still so young and immature, he's not capable of administering that estate. So his position is no different from that of a servant or a slave. He's under the orders uh, to do uh, one thing or another. He's under the control of tutors or guardians who look after his person 
and he's under the uh, governors, stewards who look after his property. And so here's this this little child, you know, he's the heir to a maybe a, this vast estate, but everything he he's not tr he can't be trusted because he's just a little child. It's only uh, when he reaches maturity that he enters into the idea of being treated like an adult mature son. Prior to that, he's just treated like a little baby. He can't be given any responsibility. And so he's under care and discipline. Everything's done for him, although he owns it all. Everything is done for him. And this will be his status until he reaches his majority, the date which is stipulated by his father. The title is his, but not the liberty or freedom of a son. Any official business will be done through his legal representatives whose signature will be necessary in any contract. And so basically, although he has got, you know, he's he's going to enter into all this, uh, he's still treated like a child. And so uh, kind of a similar thing you would see in our day is you might see somebody with a business and um, it, 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 maybe it, let's just say it's Hopkinson's and Sons. OK, it never says Hopkinson's and children, right, because that you would never bring children into the business. It's not till they reach maturity that they would be on the side, Hopkinson and sons. Right. They've reached full level of maturity. And so he tells us that uh, even though he's the heir, he's still a child. He differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. So father determines what stage he's mature enough to be treated as an adult mature son. And then he says this, even so we, now again, Paul is, I think, speaking of the Jews. It says, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of, of the world so he's now making an application and it's connected with the law that um, the law is kind of you know little children need lots of rules and regulations you know you, you as they as they mature you give them more responsibility and more freedom but when they're little it's all rules and regulations don't touch this don't do this you know that's how it is just uh, that's the thought and so he says, even so we, the Jews, in their spiritual childhood, were under this law, uh, the religious ABCs, um, <laughs> these elementary principles. They had to learn before they could graduate to their full inheritance. This legalism was bondage to the mosaic system, the elements of the world. And uh, until the law had finally run its course, preparing the way for Christ when they could be treated as mature sons if they would embrace the Messiah. So just I want you just to look again, just we're thinking about this elementary principles or the elements of the world. We're going to think about that in a moment. But I want us to look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, where again there was this tendency to go back to legalism. And so notice in Colossians 2 verse 8, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. And then notice this, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Again, it's this idea of going back to the ABCs, the elementary principles. It's the same word, the rudiments of the world. Notice again, uh, in Colossians 2 verse 20, wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. So again, that rudiments of the world. And so they're called the elements of the world or the rudiments of the world because they reflect the universal idea that mankind is bound by an obligation to earn divine favor. Uh, that was true of the law. If we look back, for instance, at Exodus, uh, book of Exodus, chapter 19, verse 5, this idea of being bound to this thing. Exodus 19, 
in verse 5 it says now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then you will be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine and so again we get this idea it's conditional that basically they uh, if you will obey my voice then you're going to enjoy all these benefits and so not only was it true of the law but Almost all religious systems are based on this same universal idea that somehow we're under an obligation to earn divine favor. So if you look at all the religions in the world, they're all based on doing stuff to get divine favor. Um, and within Islam, you know, you've got uh, pray five times a day, you've got to go on Hajj, you've got to count beads, you've got to do all this. If you do all these things, maybe you might just be able to earn uh, the favor of your supposed uh, God who you're worshiping. And so that kind of idea of the elementary principles uh, that reflect this universal idea. And so the idea that the natural man should devote himself to the externals of religious rites in order to acquire merit, mm -hmm. in the value of which to make himself acceptable to God, is the basic elemental idea in every kind of human religion today. Jewish here, Gentile in Colossians to either way, it's the same idea. And so he says, even so, we were children. We were in bondage to the elements of the world. And then it says this, but, lovely contrast word, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. So we've seen in chapter three that the work of Christ is the basis of justification. How can we be declared righteous? It's based on the finished work of Christ and our trust in him. How do we get to be sons and heirs of God? Our sonship and our heirship, again, goes back to the work of Christ. In fact, it's, it's, it's probably safe to say, <laughs> without fear of contradiction, that every blessing that comes to us spiritually comes to us through the person and work of Christ. All the spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in him. And so the work of Christ is the basis of now how God now treats us, not as children, but as sons. And so he says, when the fullness of time was come. So we're going to think about the time in which he came and then we'll think about the manner in which he came. And then we'll think of the purpose for which he came. So as we, we begin with this, the time which he came, but it was in the fullness of times. Of course, <clears throat> we think of it from a prophetic standpoint. Uh, Daniel, Daniel chapter 9 uh, talked about the coming of Messiah the Prince. And uh, so it was prophetically, the exact right time, Daniel 9, when it talks about the 70 weeks determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, and verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again, the wall even in troublous times. And of course, that's, that's talking about Nehemiah, building the walls, as we have been looking at uh, <clears throat> in our previous study. And yet he, he, here we find that uh, the Messiah, the Prince, is coming in the perfect time, uh, perfect time prophetically, but perfect time in every other way. Uh, perfect time. We've often talked about this. The Roman roads provided wonderful transportation for the spread of the gospel. And so it was a perfect time that there was a, a road network which was designed to get Rome's armies from one place to another quickly, but it was also made available for the soldiers of the cross to carry the message that Messiah had come <laughs> along these uh, these transport route routes. The Greek was the lingua franca in the entire Roman Empire, <clears throat> the language of business, and of course the New Testament written to in, in Greek. And so this message could be communicated easily, <clears throat> a wonderful vehicle for the gospel spread. 
the Pax Romana, uh, the, the Roman peace was a wonderful, again, uh, opportunity for the spread of the gospel because uh, the world was without any major wars. The, Rome had brought peace and security around the world, so it was easy to spread the gospel. And the Jewish people at the same time had a high level of messianic expectancy. We think of people like Simeon and Anna uh, waiting for the consolation of Israel. So there's all these things that are working together. The law had been around for 1,300 years, but in addition to this, the scribes and the Pharisees had imposed innumerable burdens upon men and women, and it made the message of divine grace more acceptable yeah, because it, it just was such a contrast to the to the the terrible legal bondage that the people were in and so it was like the day of liberation and freedom had arrived it was a new beginning in god's ways a radically new movement and the world was ready for it and we think of scriptures like luke 4 22 where it says all bear witness bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. What a contrast to the the the, the weight of the bondage of these elemental principles of the world that were just crushing uh, the Jewish people. Not just that, even in the Gentile world, the old religions were dying, old philosophies were empty and powerless uh, to change men's lives. Strange new mystery religions were invading the empire. Religious bankruptcy and spiritual hunger were everywhere. God was preparing the world for the arrival of his son. Just think of it. God moving behind the scenes, preparing the world for the arrival of his son. I, I couldn't help but think as I was studying this about the day we find ourselves in today. And I just wonder, is God currently preparing the world for the return of his son? It seems like all the things are coming together and uh, we're, we're getting close to that moment uh, when the trumpet will sound and the Lord will come for his own. And then, of course, after seven years, the Lord coming in glory uh, to reign for a thousand years. Another aspect of this fullness of time was the synagogue system was everywhere in the Roman Empire. And it gave the preachers an immediate platform. The way the synagogue worked, uh, a bit like uh, how many of the, the gospel halls work. If there's a visiting brother, uh, he's invited to give a word. And so it was just designed perfectly when these servants of God, like Paul, went into a, a synagogue, uh, they'd say, do you have any word for his rabbi? And of course, he would take that opportunity and preach Christ unto them. And so that was the idea. Uh, this synagogue system provided this immediate platform. So this fullness of time, when the fullness of time was come, the perfect time in history, the time appointed by God the Father. Notice verse 2, on the tutors and gover governors until the time appointed of the Father. The coming of Christ, the time appointed of the Father was a perfect time for his son to be born and later to die for the sins of the world. It couldn't have been a more perfect moment in history. The fullness of the time had come. In fact, uh, just to read one verse from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, and I, I like the way uh, the, Mark reads, uh, uh, words this verse, one, chapter 1, verse 15, saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Don't you love that? The time is fulfilled. This is the right moment now. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel because the king was here and the moment was perfect. So we've thought about the time in which he came. Now we want to think about the manner in which he came. Notice what it says. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. So the first thing we notice is that God sent forth his son. This, this seed of Abraham uh, that we read about in chapter 3, verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed 
where the promise is made. He saith not to seeds as of many, but as one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So God sending forth his son uh, 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 from heaven, the, the eternal son, whoever was in the bosom of the father. This is emphasizing his deity. God sent his son, but he was made of a woman. And of course, he's a descendant of Abraham. He's Abraham's seed. And so again, we just think of this God sending forth his son. Of course, we know John three sixteen so well, uh, the idea of God loving this world and and giving his only son. In First John, uh, where I've been in, enjoying uh, preaching all week this week, John 4, 14, it says, we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And so, on the one hand, uh, we're thinking of his deity. God sent forth his Son. And then, made of a woman, we're thinking of his humanity. And isn't it wonderful to, to see over and over again in Scripture uh, the, the, the two natures of Christ in one person, fully God and at the same time, fully man. And so... He talks about sending forth his son uh, made of a woman. And so we're thinking of his humanity here. By the way, just think of it, the cost to God of our redemption, of our being called sons. Uh, this is why he's emphasizing God sent forth his son. What it cost him to part with the one who was daily his delight in order that we might be elevated to sonship, that we might be brought into this marvelous place of dignity and privilege. And so the work was such that no other person could undertake this work. Only the son, the eternal son, who was in the bosom of the father, was capable of doing such a work. So he sends forth his son, and and so we think of his eternal pre-existence, the one who is going forth was from of everlasting, uh, Micah 5.2, is sent into the world at this moment, this fullness of time, his pre-existence, and then we think of him taking on humanity. Uh, just notice in Hebrews for a minute, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, where we noticed just an interesting little phrase, which just really stood out to me recently. Hebrews 5, verse 7, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, was heard that he feared. Notice that, in the days of his flesh. In other words, there were days innumerable, days without end, eternal days, when he did not have a body, but at the fullness of time, he took on humanity, and it's described here in the days of his flesh. So again, absolute deity, his eternal sonship, connected with perfect humanity, born of a woman, made of a woman, made of a woman, made under the law. So again, speaks of Christ's humanity, perhaps again, alluding to his role as this ultimate seed of Abraham, but also in allusion to the fact born of a woman would be taking us back to the first gospel, Genesis 3.16, what's often stated to be the proto-evangelicum, uh, the first gospel message, three, uh, sorry, Genesis 3.15, I'll put um, enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shall bruise his heel. And so the, the ultimate seed of the woman coming in the fullness of times uh, in order to crush the enemy and defeat him once and for all. And so it's interesting that almost without exception in Scripture, man's seed is referred to whether it be man or beast, male progenitors are mentioned, except for Genesis 3.15. The incarnation was not natural. It was entirely supernatural, made of a woman. 
So as son of God, the Lord Jesus would never have been under the law because he was the law giver. He gave the law on Mount Sinai. He's, he's the one who gave the law. So, But condescending uh, grace, he put himself under the law that he had made in order that he might magnify it in his life by fulfilling it perfectly and bear its curse in his death, as we've already learned in this marvelous epistle to the Galatians. And so it says that God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. And so we could say this, without Christ, men could only anticipate a hopeless end because we were condemned. The law condemned us. So without Christ coming in to fulfill the law, bear its curse, men could only anticipate a hopeless end. But with Christ, man can anticipate an endless hope. And what a, what a marvelous thing it is. And so we find ourselves in this position. So the purpose for which he came in verse 5, now again, this would be absolutely startling to the Galatians, who remember now are currently bewitched, and they're, 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 they think the law is a wonderful thing. They're, they're wanting to embrace it. They're wanting to go back under the law, even though they were Gentiles. But they're wanting to go under the law because they, it's been presented to them as, as such an advance, even though it's a, we're going to see here it's a backward step. And so they're so enamored by the law. And to hear uh, the fact that Christ came to redeem them that were under the law was a startling statement. What he's saying is law keepers had to be redeemed. <laughs> and and so, like, here they are kind of wanting to go back to a system which is described in terms of a, a, a bondage, a bondage system that needs deliverance from, that redeemed, as we've previously seen, being brought out of the slave market to never be put up for sale again. And so to redeem them that were under the law, they needed to be redeemed. Um, and so being brought out of the slave market, uh, delivering us from the bondage of the law, for what purpose? To redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Receive the adoption of sons. Now, this is where we talk about the question of adoption. It said that part of our difficulty is that when we look at the word adoption, we tend to think about how adoption takes place in our society, in our culture. And I mentioned I'd met a guy on a plane who had gone to um, one of these stands. I can't remember which one it was now. Uh, and uh, he had gone there specifically to adopt a child. It wasn't part of his family. He brought it into his family. And so that's the contemporary view in our society of adoption, somebody who belongs to another family, but you bring them into your family. Uh, but however, in adoption, adoption in Roman culture differs considerably from adoption in modern life. We think of adoption, as we said, taking someone else's child to be one's own. But in the New Testament, adoption means putting believers into the position of mature sons it literally the word means son placing or placing as sons that's the that's the meaning of the word and so putting us in the position of mature sons with all the privileges and all the responsibilities of that position and we st said last time and i say it again without hes hesitation Adoption is not the means of entry into God's family. That's not what it's talking about at all. How do we get into God's family? It's by birth. Right? You must be born again, what we call the new birth. Nobody can enter into the family of God without the experience of the new birth. So it's birth that puts us into the family. And that's when we become children of God in the sense of new babes in Christ. 
But the thing is that what God does is immediately, instead of having to go through a probationary period where we're under the law, under tutors, under governors, immediately, because of the work of Christ, he treats us as adult mature sons. No probationary period required. The minute you're saved, you're not only a child of God, but you're also a son and heir of God instantaneously. Okay? You don't have to go through a period of law. And so that's the thought that's in view here. He treats us as adult mature sons. So we don't have to go through this. And so for them to want to go back to law, it's not necessary. Why would they want to go back and put themselves under governors and tutors? Why would they want to go back to that bondage system when what Christ has done, we came into the family as children through the new birth, and immediately he treats us as sons and heirs. From the day, the minute you're saved, you become not only a child of God, but a son and heir of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And so he treats us as adult mature sons. And that's the thought of biblical adoption. We'll, we'll think more of it in a moment, but just want to state that to begin with. Now, we want to think about the proof of sonship. How do we know that we're sons? And so he says in verse 6, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. One of the evidences that we're sons and heirs is that we can call God Abba, Father. We cry, Abba. Abba Father. Actually, here it says the spirit of his son is the one crying Abba Father. But let's look at Romans just for a second. And we look at Romans 8.15. In, in this scripture, it's the spirit that's saying it. In Romans 8.15, notice, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry Abba Father. So one of the proofs of sonship is the way we speak to God. No, uh, we could say this, no slave would ever use that language. Uh, it would be a, a very strange thing for somebody who was treated like a, a slave to say Abba Father. But we say cry Abba Father. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things here. First of all, one thing that really stood out to me is in verse 4, it says, God sent forth his son. In verse 6, it says, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. Now, just think about that for a moment. Two divine persons have come out of heaven for our eternal blessing. Shouldn't that light our fire a little bit? I mean, if God be for us, who can be against us? Think about this. God sends forth his son, and now God sends forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. And, and so the, the lengths God has gone to for, on our behalf is remarkable. And so God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Christians can know intimacy with the Father because of the enjoyment of the indwelling Spirit. That's why we can call him Abba Father. That's why we can enjoy that kind of relationship. Now, let's just think a little bit about adoption um, a little bit more. Just look at Ephesians. Three references I want us to look at concerning adoption. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, he says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children or sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So predestination is a misunderstood term. Predestination has got nothing to do with unsaved people at all. In fact, it doesn't tell us in Scripture that predestinated unsaved people are predestinated to anything. Predestination is always connected with believers. And what God is saying is this, that if you trust in Christ, 
God has already predetermined the package that comes when you believe the Lord Jesus. Right? He's already made his mind up. Anybody that trusts in my son, these are the blessings that will be theirs. I have predetermined it and nothing can stop it. And so one of the things he's predetermined is that he is going to treat us not as babes, not under the elementary principles of the world, but he's predestinated. Anybody believes in his son, he's going to treat them as adult, mature sons. <laughs> That's how he's going to deal with them. And so he's predestinated us to the adoption of sons. And so what we could say is that our sonship was determined in the past. God determined. Anybody who believes in my son, this is what they're going to get. This is the package that is theirs. Galatians 4 and verse 6, which we're looking at, uh, where it talks about crying out Father, sonship enjoyed in the present, right? We're, we're enjoying this relationship with the Lord. We're enjoying not being under the elementary principles, but we can enjoy intimacy with the Lord, uh, being able to draw near and enjoy his communion and fellowship at any time. And then Romans chapter 8 is the last one I want to look at. Romans 8 verse 19 concerning adoption. <clears throat> the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 19. We notice this. It says, for the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. And so <clears throat> there's a day coming. Like we know we're sons, we know we're heirs, but there's a day coming when everybody's going to know we're sons and heirs. And so the manifestation, when we come back with Christ, it'll be evident to all that, hey, remember that guy, that weird guy in our workplace that was always talking religious stuff? Well, look at him now. He's a son and heir of God, and it will be evident to everybody. So it's sonship as seen in its future aspect. And so this wonderful truth. Now, just this term, Abba Father, it is uh, remarkable uh, as we think of this, this term. And by the way, uh, it's the very language the Lord Jesus used in Gethsemane when he spoke to his father, Abba Father. It's, it's the language of a son enjoying intimacy with his father, Abba father and um, of course it combines two greek words aramaic and greek words for the father and we just say this no slave could address the head of a family in this fashion it was reserved for the members of the family and expresses love and confidence and of course as sons we can address him as abba father what a beautiful position that is and so he says, in conclusion, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. This is the position we have been brought into as a result of the work of Christ. Not servants, sons. Where this is our privileged position. It's, it's speaking of dignity. It's speaking of our position before God, how he treats us, how he deals with us. He deals with us not as, not as children that need a bunch of rules and ABCs. He treats us as adult, mature sons, and we have all of this dignity and status of sonship which comes to us through Christ. And so he says, we're no more servants, but a son. And a son, an heir of God through Christ. So <clears throat> a son obeys out of love, while a servant obeys out of fear. We've, we're, we're dealt with it in a very different way now, aren't we? Why do, why do we obey the Lord? What does he say? If you love me, keep my commandments. We obey out of love, not out of fear. And so <clears throat> that's our new position. Emancipation, deliverance, and relationship are ours as sons, and God has also made us heirs. God, having accomplished it all, 
It has got nothing to do with works, nothing to do with human action, but everything to do with the person and work of the Lord Jesus. This is what Christ has brought us into. This is our position now as sons and heirs of God through Christ. And again, he's treating us as adult mature sons uh, and no probationary period necessary, no need to go under the law, no need to be under these elementary principles. In fact, it's a backward step to go and put yourself under those elementary principles. And that's why we see something of Paul's anxiety here, because he talks about, in verse 8, um, their, the anxiety they feels, we've already seen their transition from servants to sons through the work of Christ. And now we see this reversal that is being threatened of going from liberty back to law, uh, of turning potentially turning back to the weak and beggarly elements. Notice again, verse 9, he says, uh, uh, but now after you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? Why would you want to go back to that? And so that's the, the thought that's here. So he begins <clears throat> by noting uh, a change of position, and he reviews their spiritual history. And so he says, in verse 8, how be it then, when ye knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. So notice he talks about when, speaking about the past before their conversion. He says they were in bondage to them that were no gods. Now, I find that very interesting <laughs> how he uses this term that were no gods. I want you just to look, <clears throat> just interesting scriptures on the subject of idolatry <clears throat> i'd like you to go back to jeremiah please <clears throat> chapter five we just want to look at a few references where this thought of them which be no god speaking of idols jeremiah 5 verse 7 he says how shall i pardon thee for this thy children have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods when I had fed them to the full, they then committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlots' houses. So again, notice this. Children have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods. Look back to Deuteronomy chapter 32. <clears throat> Speaking again of, of idols. And he says they're not gods at all. They're just made by human hand. In fact, there's some amazingly humorous portions about a guy who chops down a tree and uses half of it to cook his lunch. And then the other half, he nails it uh, on a pedestal and bows down and worships it. Deuteronomy 32, 21, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provo provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. So what did they do? They moved God to jealousy with that which is not God, the hankering after idols. Second Chronicles <clears throat> chapter 13, verse 9. Second Chronicles 13, verse 9. We read this. It says, Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron, and the Levites, and have made your priests after the manner of the nations of other lands, so that whosoever cometh to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, the same may be a priest to them that are no gods? So it's just uh, consistent throughout Scripture that idols are not really gods. They're just a false, fake thing. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, uh, New Testament language, <clears throat> we get the same thing, verses 4 through 6, as concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered to, in sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be all, be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, 
as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So the universal testimony of Scripture is that these idols are not gods, even though they may be called that. <clears throat> and they do use the term, they're gods and goddesses, but they're not gods. But 1 Corinthians 10 takes us a little bit further and gives us some more information. <clears throat> Excuse me. And verse 19, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 19 and 20, which, what say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I would that you should have that you should have fellowship with that i would not that you should have fellowship with devils so <clears throat> behind the idolatry even though they're not gods <clears throat> there are demonic lying spirits that get into the role of these uh these idols and so that's kind of a, a little picture of what we're thinking of and so he reminds them back in galatians 4 verse 8 how be it then when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. So they, they were in bondage. They were in bondage to their idols. That's what they were doing. They were giving themselves, and again, this elementary principle. They're trying to please, uh, by performance, their idols. And so they're, they're, they were under the elementary principles of the world. Uh, they were in bondage to these idols. But he says in verse 9, but now, love that, but now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God. Now what we could say is this, like the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, they turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. And so they have been brought into a relationship with God. Not only did they know God, they were known of God. There's this intimacy. There's this reality of a relationship. But their current danger is this. They had turned to God from idols, but now they're making a second turn. They're, they're threatening to go back again to the same weak and beggarly elements, but this time by putting themselves under bondage to the law. And so, he, he, again, he notices this. He says, now that after you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again? Why are you making a second turn? You've already turned to God from idols. Now you're making a second turn, and you're going back into bondage to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. And again, he's, he's just marveling. Why would anybody who's set free and treated as sons and heirs want to go back to be treated like a child to be in bondage to tutors and governors all right to be put yourself under these these weak and beggarly elements how ridiculous to want to be slaves again why would a son want to go back to slavery they were not reverting to idolatry, but were placing themselves under law. It was a different kind of bondage, but it was a bondage nevertheless. And notice he says, it's weak and it's beggarly. Weak and beggarly elements. Weak because it had no power to bless. Weak through the flesh. The law might sound impressive. It does indeed. It's holy and just and, and right. And it gives us a clear view of God's righteousness but it's weak. It cannot bless us. It cannot enable us to uh, fulfill it because of the flesh. And beggarly, you know, you don't expect to be enriched by a beggar. <laughs> They're looking for you to give to them, right? Uh, again, I'm amazed here in Victoria, the number of beggars on the streets. It's just, it's, it's, it's terrible, really, to see such a beautiful city and see beggars all over the streets. And, and they're not looking to give you something. They want to get something. And so that's the law. Going back under the law, the law says give, 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 give. Does it, it, it wants you to give to it. It cannot give you anything. It has no power to enrich the weak and beggarly elements. And what are these weak and beggarly elements? Well, he describes them in verse 10. 
He says, you desire, to, you observe days and months and times and years. And so what are they going back under? They're going back into Jewish Sabbaths. That would be the days, observing days, the Sabbath days. And then the months would be the new moons. Remember, they have a lunar calendar, and then new month, noon, they usually had special celebrations. And then months, that would be the, the festivals that they would want to go back under, uh, the festival of the uh, the third month, the first month, and then uh, the seventh month, and the various festivals. And then years would be keeping the sabbatical years. Now, we could say this. We greatly appreciate the typical teaching concerning those things right we, we enjoy looking at the feast of jehovah and learning how they picture christ we, we like that and but there's a difference from enjoying the typical teaching of these things than putting yourself back under these things seeking to keep these things and so they themselves they had no power to bless or enrich it basically, I like to look at it this way. Again, let's look at Colossians, please, chapter 2. Again, we get some parallel ideas in Colossians, which I find very interesting. Colossians 2, verse 16 and 17. It says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And so the idea is this, that the Galatians, having enjoyed the substance, the reality of all these types found in the person of Christ, were now tempted to go back and play in the shadows. And how many of God's people have been bewitched and have gone back to play in the shadows when they have the substance which is in Christ? And I've met people that have put themselves back under this bondage and fail to enjoy the richness we have in Christ. It's a backward step, a desperately bad backward step. And so he says in verse 11, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. He was apprehensive as a result of this danger of defection, this danger of going back to this, this system uh, that uh, was a system of bondage. It was a weak and beggarly element. And so he had expended tremendous labor in bringing the gospel to them that's why he says he i'm afraid lest i bestowed upon you labor in vain this this word labor is labor to the point of weariness and so tremendous efforts toiling to the point of exhaustion and it had been worth it all to bring them to christ he's now afraid lest it may have been in vain to no purpose how it all must have pained him and you see, as it were, something of his pastoral heart here, his tear-dimmed eye, the bleeding heart, the care of the churches, this burden, this concern, this anxiety. And and so we see something of the Paul the shepherd here. We know he's Paul the evangelist. He'd gone there. He had preached Christ to them. He'd seen them saved. He'd labored tirelessly to see them come to Christ and now the shepherd's heart is crying out I am just uh, I'm afraid of you he's he's scared that they're going to go back to this system of bondage and so he's going to make a startling appeal to them in verses 12 down to verse 20 but we'll have to wait till next week in the will of the Lord to hear his appeal but again, just by way of kind of concluding thought, marvelous through the work of the Lord Jesus that we have been delivered from the need to go through the probationary period 
of being treated like little children, being under rules, regulations, governors, tutors. Instead, God predestinated us that the day that we believed in Christ, he would treat us as adult, mature sons and heirs. That's how he deals with us. And it's a wonderful place to be, to be a son and heir of God through Christ. We were brought into the family through the new birth. And immediately he elevated us to sons and heirs through adoption. That's our position in Christ. Amen.